Hello, my name is Benjamin Balint, and it's a special pleasure to join you from Jerusalem, but also to speak with you today about Jerusalem. And I, what I would like to do for a very short time is to share with you a project that uh, resulted in a book called Jerusalem City of the Book, it came out last year with Yale University Press, that I worked on with my colleague Merav Mack and the very distinguished photographer Frederick Brenner. And in essence, we went around the city and we tried to capture something essential about the meaning of Jerusalem through its libraries, through its archives. And what I'd like to do with you just today is to sort of take a small walking tour through the city and to try to discuss some of what we found. The basic idea here is to um, really try to ask a very simple question. Can we capture something about the magnificence and also tragedy of Jerusalem and its duality by looking uh, not in the usual way at Jerusalem as a sort of series of chronological events of uh, conquest, of liberation, but rather through its textual uh, repositories of textual wisdom. Um, you know that uh, <clears throat> The first thing that you see about Jerusalem when you look at it through his text is how Jerusalem is a place both real and imagined. There is the earthly city, which is a very mundane place, and that earthly city is somehow tethered in the imagination to symbols of timeless Jerusalem. And um, we decided to, and this is the first slide that I'll be sharing with you, <clears throat> which is a model that I think captures something of the duality of Jerusalem. As we say in Hebrew, Yerushalayim shel Mala and Yerushalayim shel Mata, the celestial Jerusalem and the earthly Jerusalem. <clears throat> and this is a model that um, was created by uh, Konrad Schick, who was actually born in Germany and lived in Jerusalem until his death in, in 2001. Um, and what we, what we discovered very, very soon is that it's not uncommon to long for Jerusalem, to yearn for Jerusalem, not just outside of Jerusalem, but that that, that momentum of longing continues in Jerusalem itself. Um, the Israeli writer Amos Oz has a novella called The Hill of Evil Counsel, in which he has a character say, I've been living in Jerusalem for three years, and I continue to yearn for it as though I were still a student in Leipzig. Surely there is a paradox here. And I would add to this paradox <clears throat> by saying that the habit of imagining Jerusalem became so deeply ingrained, especially in the Jewish diaspora, that its momentum continued even in Jerusalem itself. What else could explain the paradoxical abundance of, of copies of Jerusalem in Jerusalem archives itself? Now, what's interesting about um, Conrad Schick, the maker of this particular model, is not just that his models were unsurpassed in their intricacy and in their design, but also the other things that he did in Jerusalem. He, for example, was the, the man who planned the urban layout for the Mea Shearim neighborhood. Very few people in Mea Shearim today, uh, the ultra-Orthodox neighborhood, would would, uh, acknowledge, would know that, but um, he also built a, a terrific house based on sort of biblical principles on what's today the corner of Prophet Street and Ethiopian Street, which we're going to come back to. And um, <clears throat> the, the next, uh, the, the, the first stop that we'll make is actually in the, uh, the neighborhood that Konrad Sheik helped design, Mea Sharim. And if we go to the next uh, uh, photograph here, this is the next two photographs are, uh, are uh, record our visit to something called Kolel Galicia which is a philanthropic organization that aids <clears throat> poor people who can uh, show that they have uh, ancestry from Galicia, today Western Ukraine and Southeastern Poland. <clears throat> and uh, the head of that particular archive, was, you can see here, his name is Rabbi Fruchthandler, showed us this amazing treasure of 19th century glass plate negative photographs which recorded the poor of Jerusalem. And it turns out that when his community wanted to fundraise in Europe, they would send their shadarim, their fundraisers, out with the photographs of the people that they were raising funds for. And so this is a complete record of 19th century um, poor in, in that community of Jerusalem. It's never been digitized. 
uh, you'll see on the next slide that it exists sort of, this is not a photoshopped uh, slide at all, it exists as a kind of mosaic, they would develop one image on top of the other as a kind of palimpsest, another thing that we're going to get back to in a few minutes. But um, uh, what we thought is we maybe we could help uh, this kolel, and uh, we happen to know that the uh, leading expert in digitizing these kinds of photographs happens to be a man named Jean-Michel de Tarragon, who is a member of the Dominican community of Jerusalem, which is about a 10-minute walk from this kolel in Measheharim. And of course, no member of Rabbi Fruchthandu's community has ever stepped foot into the Dominican community, uh, which is called Ecol Biblique, uh, right on the seam line of East and West Jerusalem. But we went there nonetheless to see, to learn a little bit about digitization. And uh, while we were there, we were introduced to the library there, which uh, focuses on Semitic grammars, books of uh, ancient Near Eastern history and archaeology. And uh, they took us down into the, uh, again, the Dominican library. And they have a special shelf there uh, where uh, it's called the Eliezer Ben Yehuda shelf. Now, Eliezer Ben Yehuda lived very, very close to where Conrad Schick lived. Uh, he lived on Ethiopia Street. And every morning when he was preparing his dictionary, uh, which I have here, to give you an example, his, his multi-volume dictionary of the Hebrew language, and he was resurrecting the ancient tongue into a modern tongue, uh, he would, Eliezer ben Yehuda would go and visit the Dominican library and look at their Semitic grammars and dictionaries. And the uh, Dominicans have a kind of urban legend that modern Hebrew was born here, they like to say, at a Kol Biblique, and they've kept the, the shelf of, um, uh, of books that he used to consult, some of which with his marginal notations, and they've kept them there ever since. So we were unsuccessful in the end um, with, di with helping digitizing the Kolo Galicia um, uh, collection of photographs because they are uncomfortable both with uh, partnering with a Christian institution um, but we, we did discover another gem about um, sort of uh, how permeable the uh, boundaries between one uh, community and, and the next is when it comes to Jerusalem's texts. Um, Speaking of, of Ethiopia Street, the next image is, uh, uh, belongs to the, Christ, the Christian Orthodox, Ethiopian Orthodox Library in Jerusalem. This is um, one of the members of that community, which is just across the street from where Eliezer ben Yehuda used to live, holding up a 17th century manuscript called Darsana Mikael, uh, which is basically a midrash about the archangel um, Michael. And what's interesting about this manuscript, as, as with several others in their collection, is that these manuscripts were brought on the backs of pilgrims and monks who came on foot from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to establish the community here. If any of you have seen the movie Exodus with Paul Newman, you will recognize that some of the best scenes of that movie happen in the Ethiopian compound. Um, where the library is also kept. And uh, this also speaks to uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the yearning for Jerusalem that uh, I would say makes Jerusalem act as almost the center of gravity that attracts longing but also attracts material culture in the form of books from all four corners of the earth to, uh, to the sacred city. The next two images um, are from the Syriac community, and this is one of the oldest Christian communities um, in Jerusalem, and the, we got to meet the present librarian named Abuna Shimon, who uh, comes from the Turabdin region in Turkey, came to Jerusalem uh, in the 1980s, and most of their texts are in Syriac, which is essentially a form of Aramaic. So it's the form also in which the Talmud was written. And uh, what's extraordinary about Abu Nashimon is he told us once that there are certain texts that he reads 
that uh, he holds in such esteem, that, are ven- that he venerates to such a degree that he kneels when he, uh, when he reads them. So we captured Abu Nashimon. The first images of, of me talking with Abu Nashimon, consulting him about those texts, and uh, the second one is of him kneeling in the courtyard of the Syriac monastery. Now, what's incredible here is that um, you may know that several years ago, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York put on a major exhibition about Jerusalem. And we sort of helped them. Um, we introduced some of the curators to some of the major figures, including Abu Nashimon. And uh, the the curators of the Met were looking for sort of, um, you know, <clears throat> The, the, the treasures from each of the communities to bring back to the Met in New York. And each time Abu Nashimon would never allow us into the library itself, he would always uh, go up to the library and take down whatever text we would request it. Finally, Mirab and I, uh, many months later, were able to visit this library with Abu Nashimon and we discovered that the reason he didn't want us into the library is not because the books are particularly... He's not, he's not concerned about theft or anything. He's concerned about the shameful state of the library. The community, like Kola Galicia, simply doesn't have the resources to, um, to really keep its textual treasures in the form... Uh, in a, to, to preserve them in a good way. So... <clears throat> The, uh, the, it was, in a sense, uh, shame that motivated him from, uh, to prevent us from uh, entering the library. Now, another library that we didn't get in access to, uh, but in a very telling way, belongs to the Karliner Hasidim in Jerusalem. And we met with the Karliner Rebbe, um, and the Karliner uh, community before the Second World War had uh, w- one of the greatest and richest repositories of Hasidic uh, texts in the world. And of course, it was uh, destroyed and scattered during the Second World War. And ever since the community has reconstituted itself in Jerusalem, they've been um, sending out emissaries to book auctions, for example, to look at at, and to purchase any text that has the stamp of the original Karliner Stolin library and to try to reconstitute that, that library after this great loss. Now, we met with the Cardinal Rebbe. We were warned, you only have a few minutes with him. He's, he's, uh, uh, we went into this, this uh, kind of waiting room where uh, all of his Hasidim were waiting to go into his private study and to uh, ask him a question. And then the door would open and the next one would go in. And in the end, we were there for 45 minutes because he was so fascinated in the other textual treasures of Jerusalem and the other libraries. And he said to us, uh, the, the Rebbe did, if I could, I would go incognito to, uh, with you to these other libraries to, to see how they manage themselves. Now, this is a library that we never got access to, as I mentioned, because in fact, nobody has access uh, except for the Rebbe himself. And the reason for that, I think, is, well, he told us, why would you need to visit my library physically? We digitize everything on the, when, it, when it's acquired, and you can see all of our texts in digital form. There's no reason for you to visit the library itself. This, in, in the one sense, speaks of the modern era of what a library means, but in a second sense, speaks to the trauma of loss, of losing that library. So uh, it's a library that only one man ever visits. Even the librarian itself, who's the, in charge of ac- acquisitions for that library, never uh, steps foot into that, into that particular library. Um, <clears throat> the next image is, uh, let's see. Eight and nine. The final two images usher us into uh, the Armenian quarter and to a manuscript library that is uh, highly inaccessible, open once a year, called the St. Toros Manuscript Library, which has texts that date all the way back to the 8th century. 
and uh there is it's you know there's not even electricity in in this particular library you can see that it's from this image that it's uh originally a chapel if you if a scholar wants to examine a particular text they have to take an extension cord from outside and uh, bring a lamp in um it has about 4000 manuscripts and uh to learn about it we met the present uh, patriarch of Jerusalem, which is the next image, uh, Patriarch Manugian, the 97th Armenian Patriarch of Jerusalem. He was born in Aleppo, and uh, he told us something quite extraordinary. He says, some of our manuscripts, the Armenian manuscripts, are so precious that they're not even in the manuscript library, they're in the treasury. Now, this uh, image that you see, that, uh, the portrait that Frederick took of, of the patriarch, is actually on the treasury day when they take uh, various items from the treasury and they have a kind of procession um, uh, where they put sacred objects, either they hold them or they put them on velvet pillows, including sometimes some, some manuscripts, gospels of, uh, of Queen Keran, etc. And he told us, you know, some of our, our manuscripts are so precious, they're not even kept in this manuscript library that's open only once a day. They're actually uh, uh, kept in the treasury. And the treasury, which is to say that the book is not for use, it's a sacred object in and of itself. The treasury, he said, has uh, three locks and three people must be present at the same time, each with their own keys. Well, um, two members of the of the clergy and one from the lay community to all open up the the uh, the door of the treasury at the same time. I thought of it as a kind of the nuclear codes of of Jerusalem. So this is another way in which the texts of Jerusalem are hidden away. Uh, in this case, because of of their their value. Now. I would like also to, uh, not far from the Armenian community, to take you downhill a little bit into uh, the Muslim uh, quarter, where there, until um, the uh, f the founding of the state in 1948, there was a uh, yeshiva that was uh, started by the Vinograd uh, family. And one day uh, we met uh, one of Jerusalem's uh, great bibliographers. His name is Yeshayahu Vinograd. He spent his life on Jewish books and Jewish texts. And he told us, yes, my family started this uh, yeshiva in the, in the old city. And uh, uh, just before the war, uh, we had to flee. And as we, we fled in such haste that all the books of the library were left as they were on the shelves. It so happened, he said, that there was a Palestinian janitor who knew the significance of these texts, <clears throat> although he couldn't read them himself. And he took it upon himself during the War of Independence to plaster them behind a false wall and thereby to save them. So, two days after the cessation of hostilities in the 1967 Six-Day War, Vinograd and several members of his family go back to the yeshiva, and they go to the property, and they're told that this Palestinian janitor has, uh, and groundskeeper has died in the meantime, but that he entrusted the secret of these Hebrew books to his brother and they find the brother and sure enough they pull down the false plaster wall and the entire library of this yeshiva which is today on Alwad street in the muslim quarter was preserved and by the way it's still a yeshiva today now it's leased to the ateret kohanim group so Merab and i do what you do in jerusalem which is uh, we try to verify the story by simply knocking on people's doors so we went to this uh, corner where the yeshiva was and we started to ask people and finally one uh, shopkeeper says yeah I know that story and I know the family of the uh, the Palestinian janitor and let me show you where it is so we knocked on this door and uh, within a few minutes uh, 
we explained what we were there for and we were seated on a, uh, in the living room with a woman named Dina Albasha and her father was the man who had saved this library. And it's quite an incredible instance, I would say, of uh, preserving not just one's own textual heritage, but preserving the memories of, of others. In this case, a Palestinian family, uh, which to this day takes great pride in saving the library of a yeshiva in the, the Muslim quarter of Jerusalem. I'd like to conclude with uh, two examples, not from ancient libraries, but from the most modern libraries in Jerusalem. Uh, the first uh, is the one that houses the Dead Sea Scrolls at the basement of the Israel Museum, and the second is the National Library of Israel. One day, uh, my, my colleague Merav and I were ushered into a windowless room in the basement of the Israel Museum where the Dead Sea Scrolls are kept in a temperature-controlled climate, but even more so, they are uh, at present being photographed by the most sophisticated camera in the country, which is taking pictures of each scroll and each fragment of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 12 wavele wavelengths, seven of them infrared and five visible. Um, with uh, resulting in 28 exposures, all of which is bringing to light certain illegible uh, letters and illegible lines that have uh, never been uh, able to be deciphered before. So this is a, an example, I would say, of how uh, modern technology can meet ancient theology in ways that are unique to Jerusalem. The second modern library is the National Library of Israel, <clears throat> which now sits on the Givat Ram, Ram campus of the Hebrew University. And I thought I would conclude with this because it points to the question of, uh, as we mentioned before, how Jerusalem acts as a center of gravity and uh, how certain assumptions are made about what belongs in Jerusalem. And this is the story of the, 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 the present uh, National Library of Israel now has some of the uh, estate of um, Franz Kafka's manuscripts that were br brought here by his best friend um, uh, Max Brod from Prague to uh, Tel Aviv and were the subject of an international dispute. And I wrote about this dispute in a book that was actually published also in Polish and English. It's called Kafka's Last Trial. And I was sitting in the Supreme Court of Israel in 2016, listening to these deliberations about who really owns the legacy and manuscripts of uh, Franz Kafka. On one side was the National Library of Israel making the assumption that because Kafka was a Jewish writer, in essence, uh, he belongs uh, to the, it's almost as if uh, the, the, the culmination of the Jewish story, even a story that began elsewhere, belongs in Jerusalem. Therefore, Kafka, although he never, of course, stepped foot in this country and never visited Jerusalem, somehow they were making the argument that his manuscripts belong here, as if to say the culmination of the diaspora story, even a story that may have taken place in the diaspora, the culmination belongs in Jerusalem. On the other side were, was the German literary archive in Marbach, which made the claim that, of course, uh, you know, Kafka is essentially a uh, German writer. He belongs firmly in the German modernist canon. And um, his, the fact that he wrote in German is decisive. And besides, they have better facilities, etc. So I took an interest in this uh, in, in, in this story is really a story that uh, has a lot to do with how Jerusalem sees itself as a repository of culture, both from the ancient, from the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is the most ancient library that originated in Jerusalem before it was <clears throat> brought down to the Qumran, from the most ancient to the most modern, and the most modernist, which is Franz Kafka. In, every, in each of these cases, and the full range in between, uh, there's a sense in which um, these 
textual repositories belong, belong in Jerusalem as a place that sent out culture into the world, but also attracted culture unto itself. In the end, we came to see uh, Jerusalem as a palimpsest. Palimpsest, and we saw several examples of it during our uh, tours of Jerusalem libraries, is when a manuscript is uh, reused and a newer manuscript is written atop of an older one. In many cases, the older manuscript is preserved even unwittingly, even accidentally, by the process of writing on top of it. And we came to see Jerusalem itself as a kind of a palimpsest, which is to say a, a repository of cultures in which each of these languages and each of these communities is talking to its talking to one another, reaching reaching out to one another across the centuries, across the languages, uh, but also in that process preserving the memories of others, not just the memories of one's own community. So with that, I would like to uh, thank you for joining us on this small walking tour of, of, of Jerusalem and its libraries, and uh, I hope you've uh, enjoyed uh, learning something about how uh, Jerusalem, you know, both the Jerusalem of the celestial Jerusalem and the earthly Jerusalem, even if they are an uneasy cohabitation with, with one another, are still visible.